progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we look to open the word of the Lord and that of his prophet, shall we seek his guidance so that we may more clearly understand that which is being presented before us as instruction, as guidance, as a map, as light before our feet, so that we may more directly understand the message and the work that is yet before us. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath day, for the rest, from the labors of the week, for the opportunity that we have to come before you together, to look, to learn, to observe, to be instructed. Help us now, Father, that as we cover these items, as we cover these lessons that you have provided, that our minds may be willing and be open so that that which we need for the work that is yet to be done may become clear. Help us now. May your angels attend us. May your spirit be with us, for as you have promised, where two or three are gathered together, there I will be also. For this we thank you, for this we praise you. And in all things, in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Now. We're going to center on Zephaniah 2, verse 3. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be that ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. What does that verse have to say to us today? What instruction, what guidance, and what blessing is it offering? Well, that God's going to protect us in, well, during the time of the plagues. That is, if we are seeking judgment which is, and righteousness and meekness. Okay. Now, last week, we left off in reading several portions from Mrs. White's writings that have an interrelationship with the book of Zephaniah. We're going to return to that now. Now, <coughs> please note, this is letter 10. 1873. So we're dealing with a letter that is written 29 years after 1844, right? Um, yeah, that would be correct. We're dealing with the 10th letter. Now, is there anything symbolic about the number 10? Well, it can refer to a test. Okay. When we take a look at this further, the date of the letter of May 14th, 1873, and we look this up with the calendar converter, it is written on the 16th day of the second month of 5918. And here it is addressed to Brother Uriah Smith. We received your letter last evening, but we could not really understand your letter.
How difficult is that to understand? Uriah Smith has written a letter to the whites. This letter is being sent about seven years before the passing of James White and is being sent about 15 years before the general conference session where the church rejected the message of righteousness by faith. Now we don't have Uriah Smith's letter. Correct. Okay. We don't have it or it has not been published. Mm -hmm. I do not think you understand your own position. The Lord has not left you in darkness. He has followed you with testimonies of reproof and warning for years. During this time, you have not sensed your condition. You thought you were in need of nothing. What is that saying to us? What, what biblical passage comes to mind for someone that believes that they are in need of nothing? Well, it's um, in Revelation 3 about the lay of the sea and spilling. They have need of nothing because they're filled with goods. You know, they have everything. They, they're complacent. Okay, now you were saying, Theodore? Yeah, um, could you have that, obviously, the Laodicean message? Um, and you also have, uh, there is a section which I can't remember where it is. <clears throat> but anyway, it'll come to mind uh, in Paul's writings where. Hi, guys. About this. Hi, Mark. Hi. I say hi, and yep. I will share what I did say to Theodore last day I will share at two o'clock I heard God saying in my heart why you are mad at me I will say it at two o'clock okay. I will repair it. Okay. Thanks Mark. So <clears throat> she is being gentle. You thought you were in need of nothing. You could not see why you were not about right. The testimonies of reproof have appeared to you uncalled for. Your great lack has been of coming up and taking your position in seeing and reproving wrong. I called upon you at your house to try to help you. I felt that I had a duty to do in saying to you what I did in regard to the case of Brother Aldrich, that your non-committal position sustained him in his wrong course. Your influence and Harriet's did sustain and justify the cause of J.M. Aldrich. Have we seen recently a non-committal position Especially yep. where wrongs should have been reproved. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we'll see what happens. What will be, will be. I'm not going to take a stand on one side or the other. I'm going to remain completely neutral. Is this what God would have us to do? No. Time will tell. Nice phrase. Your great lack has been of coming up and taking your position in seeing and reproving wrong. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Good.
God was reproving his wrongs through my husband and through visions. But notwithstanding the testimonies of reproof, the wrongdoers had your sympathies and the reprover of wrong, your suspicions and distrust. You were supporting the wrong side. J.M. Aldrich pleased those who had but little spiritual discernment. The course pursued by J.M. Aldrich was not pleasing to God. His influence had a tendency to draw away from Christ. He was moral and intelligent, of good address and interesting, but the heart was not right. And beneath the surface, the character was defective. Moral, spiritual power was weak. His influence upon you and many others was not of a spiritual character. However agreeable his society, However amusing and attractive his conversation, he did not gather with Christ. Under whose banner are we to stand? There are only two. The bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel or the black banner. So if our <clears throat> if our society is agreeable, if our conversation is amusing and attractive, are we then gathered with Christ? We need to have our yes be yes, our no be no. We need our direct influence to be that for and of Christ. And it does, go ahead. Well, when, when communicating with other people, I mean, we can't always be too direct if we're trying to, to communicate not, and convince somebody of truth um you know we have to be somewhat you know wise as serpents and harmless as doves but sometimes in doing so we think that we're winning people um when we're not because there are things that are error that we do need to speak out against and when we we take somebody and we allow them to uh, I guess maybe in a sense we flatter them even though they're teaching error as a way to win them it's actually not beneficial I, I don't know how else to, to really say it but um, people need to know clearly where we stand on an issue agreed yeah <clears throat> Had you received the testimony God gave in regard to J.M. Aldrich, you would have been saved from spiritual declension and great spiritual blindness and deception. You were pleased with the external J.M. Aldrich. The Lord's eye searched the inmost recesses of the heart and life. Had you prized the light God had sent to you, you would have discerned the wrongs existing in J.M. Aldrich and in the integrity of your soul would have stood with those whom God moved upon to reprove wrong and sin. As you seek to accommodate yourself to the spirit and feelings of those who are not right with God, you imbibe their spirit, and you cannot escape the contagion of their worldly spirit or avoid being influenced by the atmosphere which affects them. You do not perceive any danger. You see no necessity for any warning of danger or reproof because of wrong. You and Harriet have despised reproof and warning. Their household shows to despise reproof and warning. 
their marital community was knit together to despise reproof and warning. The Lord knows the value of the soul. He who withheld not his own beloved son to save man would warn and reprove when he sees there is any hindrance to souls attaining salvation. God sees their dangers and sends words of warning to awaken fear. But if those warned are not devotional, if spiritual darkness has blinded their eyes, they cannot see their danger. This, I have been shown, was your position. Was she being unkind in these words that were written? Unkind? What do you mean? I see a person that's very concerned for the very salvation of Uriah and Harriet Smith. Mm -hmm. Was she being mean or rude? No. Was not mean or rude. Okay. Uriah, you and Harriet have lived at so great a distance from the breath of heaven and the influence of the Society of Heavenly Angels that your feelings and fancy have been in unison with the sympathies which unite human society. You assimilated more and more to their temperament, though they breathe not the atmosphere of heaven and are not in communion with God. This friendship and congeniality with those who are not right with God only brings you into darkness, leads you to love the things from beneath, and alienates you more from things above. Yet you are in a perfect deception in regard to these things. A spiritual lethargy has been from year to year gathering and growing about you until it threatens to destroy your usefulness and your souls, while at the same time, there may not be marked transgression or grievous wrong to human eyes. While you feel that all is right, you have imperceptibly been sliding away from God and inhaling an atmosphere that will stupefy your moral sense of right and wrong and confuse your spiritual judgment so that you cannot discern right. Wrong will appear right and right will appear wrong. It's a hard position to find oneself in. <clears throat> you could be a man after God's own heart if you stood unaffected by de deleterious influences. If you moved among those influences unaffected by them, preserving a devotional spirit, you would create an atmosphere around you which would prove a safeguard to those influences which are virtually irreligious <clears throat> and would enable you to exert a saving power over those who have influenced you. You could, by consecration to God, maintain a high degree of spirituality and so surround yourself with the light of heaven that you would be in no danger of contamination in the sphere of action to which God has called you by his providence. <clears throat> if you would not follow inclination, if you would guard your affections and bind yourself to Christ <clears throat> with the strongest cords of devotion and love, making friendship and relationship and everything in this life secondary to the glory of God, then you need not walk in darkness, for God will be by your side an ever-present friend.
Brother Uriah, you remarked to me that you could not go with Brother White in his course of dealing with Brother Aldrich, that things were chain, charged to Brother Aldrich that he was not guilty of. I ask you wherein. <clears throat> you referred to the debt of lumber that Aldrich was blamed for selling to Russell when he was not to blame in the matter. I then explained to you the facts in the case. You could not remember anything in regard to the circumstances, although to my certain knowledge, you were there and witnessed the whole matter. But your discernment was perverted. You could not feel over the matter and discern the true situation of faithful men. This feeling was expressed. Yeah, unfaithful men. Unfaithful men. This feeling was expressed, confirms that which has been shown me in reference to your position in connection with these men who were unfaithful and dishonest before the Lord. I saw that you did not discern between right and wrong, that you would call darkness light and light darkness, that notwithstanding the course of these men had been demonstrated, the result of their course fully developed. And it was evident to all who had the spirit of God and discernment that the curse of God was upon these men. Yet you could not see what they had done so much out of the way that you could not excuse and pass over. In sympathizing with them in their wrong, you were a partaker with them. You sustained them in their positions. In the last view given me, I saw that in standing on the wrong side in these cases, your judgment was perverted, your discernment blinded. You thought that if, if Brother White would not stir up things by reproving, everything would move along quite smoothly. He, you thought, as did Ahab in the case of Elijah, was the troubler of Israel. <clears throat> in the case of William Gage, you could not see that there was so much out of the way with him. You enjoyed to chat and laugh with him. You could not see why he was not the man for the place. If you, have, if you could have seen as God seeth, if you could have looked upon his case as God viewed it, you could have taken your position. And your words and actions would have been of such a character that you could have been a transforming influence over him. Your position in the office is of such importance that if you take an easy position, let wrongs and sins pass along as though nothing were the matter, it would be next to an impossibility for others to correct these wrongs. Your non-committal position, <clears throat> saying and doing, <clears throat> your non-committal position, saying and doing nothing unless it be to strengthen the side God is seeking to weaken, stands directly in the way of those who would correct error, and who would set things in order. In William Gage's case, your influence sustained him, and you were a partaker of his sins. God's frown is upon the entire family. If we choose not to reprove wrongs, are we then not partaking in the sins that we seek to shun to reprove? What has she just said here? How are we to accept this testimony? Well, I, I mean, I'm not sure exactly how we can apply it. I mean, we need to look at ourselves. 
and try to decide how how we relate to those that are in error, including ourselves, um, that we can participate in an error by, um, and and then when you see this, you know, this this whole idea of of his family, um, there's just this tendency to excuse evil. William Gage, the question is, who is William Gage? So he worked at the uh, the Review and Herald office. Um, if you read in the SDA encyclopedia, when it talks about him, it doesn't really say anything negative. I mean, he left the church for a short time in the 1870s um, and then came back, and then he was ordained as a minister. He also worked in... Uh, writing the obituary with Uriah Smith of James White. So, and he eventually did resign and left uh, Adventism, it appears, somewhat later in life, I think. Just looking at it briefly here. He was only 65 when he died in 1907. Thanks. Uh, do you know who J.M. Aldrich was? Um, well, I couldn't find anything. I uh, just I saw something on Aldrich, but it wasn't him. Yeah, I, I haven't found him, um, who he is. Uh, he's not mentioned in the SDA encyclopedia. He said I can find. Okay. All right. Your lax government is seen in your own family. Your firmness does not serve you. You permit your children to come up instead of training them restraining them and disciplining them. The same deficiency is carried out and developed in the office and in the church. There's a defect in your character to be easy and pleasant and agreeable to those who are an offense to God. While those are tr who are thrust in by the Lord to bear reproof and testimony of warning, you think unduly severe and stirring up strife. Harriet has had great influence upon you in your married life, in molding your character. And for this, she must answer to God. I can but call to mind the princes of renown that were with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram in rising up against Moses and saying, you take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Numbers 16, three. After the matter was demonstrated, those who rebelled were destroyed. The next morning, the people murmured against Moses more decidedly than ever, charging the death of these mighty men upon Moses, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. Their judgments and discernment had been so long molded and directed in the wrong channel, sympathizing with the wrong and calling sinful men whom God was continually reproving and correcting, holy that they honestly thought things were just as they appeared to them. The terrible exhibition they had witnessed of how God regarded their murmuring and complaining only settled them the more firmly that all this was chargeable upon Moses. He was, they honestly thought, at the bottom of the whole matter. And these good men 
that the earth swallowed up were the martyrs standing in the defense of Israel. <clears throat> the very same spirit that existed in the armies of Israel exists now. The very same hatred of reproof and the very same spirit is seen when efforts are made to correct the wrongs and set things in order among the people of God now, as in the days of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Okay, so, so one um, question here, I guess. Or sure. comment. So, so we know that wrongs do exist. And, and, and the question is, how do we go about trying to correct wrongs? I mean, it's it's not it's not necessarily an easy thing, right? It's not something that um, that we we have um, because you know you don't want to chase people off. So there's you know the struggle that we go through. Let's say there's uh, see. I think part of the problem is there are wrongs that are easy to reprove and wrongs that are difficult to reprove. And the more important a person is, the more difficult it is to reprove their wrongs. Um, I really don't know how to put it without going into too much detail. But when we reprove wrongs, let's look at it this way. When Ellen White has seen wrong, that God has instructed her, instructed her to reprove. She is patient in her endurance in continually reproving that wrong by addressing the person themselves. Correct? Okay. Right. So it's not so much she doesn't go and start publishing abroad you know, to everyone about the person's wrong. She goes to that person. What was the instruction of Christ? Well, to go in, in, you're talking about what, Matthew 15, I think it is? Yeah. Yeah, well, you go to that brother, first you and him alone, and try to be reconciled with your brother, and then you bring two or three others with you. And then if they won't hear you, then you bring it to the church. Uh, but And it's not a quick process. I mean, there, it, there's, we, we should be laboring for others. But sometimes that person has no interest in being labored to. Right. But one thing I find is, at least from my personal experience, I've heard a lot about me, not just, you know, in the movement, but, you know, through the, through the years, through the grapevine. And I would have people come to me and say, well, there's, there's someone who has a problem with you. And I said, well, if they have a problem with me, how come they're not coming and talking to me? And, you know, it, it's always, I've always been puzzled by this, that people will talk to others, but they won't talk to the person that, that they're having the problem with, or that they think is an error. And of course, that's not going to do anything to the person who's an error. It's not going to help them. So this personal labor, I think, is part of what she's talking about in reproving wrongs, not so much a public, you know, an attack upon a person, but but the private counsel of correcting a brother who is in error. Okay. But why will we not do that sometimes? I mean, what are the reasons we may not go to somebody to correct them? Uh, there's could be a number of reasons. One is they may be in a position of power, and we may fear. Uh, the results of um, being on the wrong side of that person. Um, there could be other reasons. Maybe, you know, just we personally want to be friends with that person that might be connected to that idea. Or we also may have things in our own lives that need to be reproved and corrected. But if we start to reprove and correct others, 
then that that would bring focus to the things in ourselves that need to change. So sometimes by palliating error um, in others, it's really because we're unwilling to deal with error in ourselves. So that's just a few thoughts and thinking over, you know, what, what we're reading here. As I read this letter, I see Mrs. White as a, a person that is very concerned about the salvation of Harriet and Uriah Smith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's not there condemning them to to make to puff herself up or anything like that. She's there to try to restore. Now, she's <clears throat> going to them privately mm -hmm. she's being direct and she's being concerned but she's also recognizing that uriah and harriet have chosen that her testimony is not what they want to hear She's trying to make an, an impact upon their heart. If you had no feelings against my husband, Uriah, why did you persist in reading those letters in meeting? After I had conversed with you and fully set before you his true feelings in regard to you, and after I had told you of his feeble condition of health, where was your tender sympathy and love seen for my husband in his feebleness? Why didn't you care about what was going on? He had shown how much he had your interest at heart by seeking to work things and plan for your temporal matters that you might be advantaged. You had not cause for your feelings. Your feelings, I have not the least hesitancy in saying, were unjust and cruel. I think a spirit comes upon you to sustain wrong so firmly that if you knew and some others knew that your course would bring discouragement upon my husband which would cost him his life, you would in this particular instance have a special zeal to carry out your feelings, even to the bitter end. But your zeal does not get roused to correct real wrong that God reproves and heaven condemns in sinners who have hindered the work of God and cursed his cause, who have been entreated and reproved and warned repeatedly for years. Your firmness slumbers and does not come to you. And you are powerless to reprove and withstand, notwithstanding the honor of God's cause is in peril. At the meeting at our house, God's spirit was there. This power was upon my husband and was manifested in a marked and wonderful manner. But this made no impression upon you. Earnest prayer was offered to God in your behalf. We were burdened for you. Brother Andrews and Wagner were greatly blessed but your own spirit resisted the pleadings of God's spirit. If I know anything of the spirit of God, you would not let the spirit of God affect you. You hardened your heart and stiffed your neck like a rebellious self-willed child. Who else was said to have a hard heart? whose heart had been, had been stiffened by the Spirit of God. 
Was it not Pharaoh? Were the children of Israel not noted as being a stiff-necked people, especially where they were reproved by Moses, by Joshua, and by the judges? By Stephen, too. All the way through, <clears throat> when they were confronted with words of reproof, did they not rebel? Mm -hmm. Oh, how appropriate would be all this firmness have been if exercised to correct those who were wrong, who were in sin, who were dishonest before God, whom his frown was upon. You can have a set will, a determination, when you choose to have it, but unfortunately it is on the wrong side. The very one who deserved your sympathy and your love and affection and thoughtful consideration did not get it. Had you come up to the help of God by the side of my husband and united with my husband to call wrong, wrong, and dishonesty, dishonesty, there would have been an entirely different state of things in the office and in the church. The human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Oh, that your energy and determination could be exercised in standing before the right. In this situation, there are words that come to mind. A house divided against itself cannot stand. At this point, we are seeing that the leadership of the church at this time was divided. Do we have the same issues today within the movement? Is there a spirit of disunity within the movement, are we a house divided? Are we, are we personally fomenting that division or are we seeking to become unified one to another? My husband's life has been, has been nearly sacrificed more than once by those connected with him in the work and cause at Battle Creek. Yet he does not awaken sympathy. He does not excite pity. But those who have brought reproach upon the cause of God have your pity and your sympathy. I was shown that Brother Smith and Brother White should stand together as two pillars in that office. Pillars are the most important part of the building. They support the building. If these two would have stood united in heart, the tone of the office would have been much more exalted. God calls for workers in the office and in the church, men who will realize the greatness of the work and be wise builders in this great cause. Eternity alone will reveal the results of such workmen. God's eye is upon every worker in the building. God's eye is upon every member within the movement. God's eye are, is upon us individually always. The importance of everyone's influence is measured by the great inspector. The riches of glory are reserved as a reward for faithful workers. For the perfection of the building they are erecting. Its symmetry, 
and beauty depend upon the united faithfulness of the true willing workers. Those who would give indulgence to sin are unfaithful workers in whatever position they may be serving. God designed that Uriah should be a very important and efficient worker in rearing the great building, but he was in danger of suffering the work to be marred and corrupted where he should be vigilant to see that it was perfect. Council after council may meet, and unless Uriah shall manifest more earnest in his position, everything will be lax and the work done unfaithfully. Earnest there refers to um, basically like a down payment. Yes, because Uriah was to manifest a more earnest interest in his position. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just an expression we wouldn't really use nowadays in that sense. But it's also more earnest that he needed to be more faithful. Yeah. In his yeah. position. Yeah, but it, it, it's, I, I just bring it up because of the word earnest, what it, what it would mean to Ellen White. Um, so this is, I mean, obviously we, we've, we've, we've used that word, but it's kind of morphed its connotations a bit over time. So that means he needs to put everything he has into the work that he's doing. So I surrender all. Zeal is required of those in responsible positions in the office, not a zeal to clothe wrong with a dress of righteousness or to make sin appear purity. By calling things of their right name, Uriah may stir, he may irritate, yet this will be the very work that God would have him to do. Let the result be what it may. The work is God's. And he designated that Brother Smith should be a finished worker, writing, preaching, and visiting different states, and spreading the knowledge of the truth in every possible way he can. But he is not safe unless he works in unison with the Spirit of God. And God works through him. If he refuses to be the workman, God would have him. God will have a man ready to do the work he designated. Uriah should do. In other words, if Brother Smith chose not to be united with the Spirit of God, that another would be brought to the fore to do the work that had been initially planned for Brother Smith to have done. Is this something we wish to have said of us? God would have Brother Smith visit foreign countries as his missionary if he would do the work of God thoroughly and faithfully. If the same irresponsible position is carried out by him in the future, as in the past, the most limited his influence, the better. He will not, he cannot build up any cause. The same lax, irresponsible course he has manifested in his family and carried out in the office and in the church disqualify him for being a man after God's own heart. He does the work of God negligently. The curse of God rested upon Miraz, not because guilty of enormous crimes above others, but for neglect. There was a work that Miraz shunned. Curse ye Miraz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, 
to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Judges 5.23. The powers of darkness are at work and are brought to bear more upon those who are engaged in advancing the interest of God's cause. Satan will come in at every avenue, every spot that is not guarded. There will always be a work to do to defend the right and to condemn the wrong. I saw that Brother Smith's mind had been molded by his past experience in his connection with Sister Smith, and that his sense of wrong was not acute. Satan would plant his hellish banner in his own house and in the office, and he did not perceive it, but think that it was the banner of the cross of Christ. Brother Smith's position has been a defective one. God wants men who have spiritual eyesight, or they are good for nothing in his cause. What does God want? Men and women of spiritual eyesight. If they have not spiritual eyesight, what good are they? Cursed be he that doth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. Moab hath been at ease from his youth, and he hath settled upon his lees. Jeremiah 48, 10, and 11. The wrath of God was kindled against Saul because he did not carry out his work of justice in the smiting of Amalek and utterly destroying them. And it shall come to pass that at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and will punish the men that are settled upon their lees and say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Zephaniah 1 verse 12. Brother Smith has excellent qualifications, but he hath the work to do that he has excused himself from performing, and he has not sustained those whom God has called to reprove sin and wrong. Therefore, spiritual blindness has come upon him. These words and this warning were given in 1873. Now I see that Revelation 2 verses 4 and 5 and 1 1 Samuel 15 are being addressed in the chat. Why? One of them is a warning about the candlestick being removed because the person or the church being addressed has lost his his or their first love. And then the second one is about Saul and he refused to I see, you know, the, 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 the Amalekites right to the end, like take everything, destroy everything, them and everything they owned. And Samuel reproved them and said that, that his disobedience was as the sin of witchcraft and idolatry. Over these last several months, We have been separated from other brothers and sisters. And it's a separation of their own choice. Was Uriah Smith separated from James White by the choice of James White? No. Who then created the separation? Well, Uriah Smith did. Here we are given a, an example. We're given a testimony. Mrs. White is very concerned about the spiritual future of Uriah Smith. 
and his connection with the work. Yet there are some today that would proclaim Uriah Smith as being a prophet. Here we have an example. The Uriah Smith controlled not his own house and did not have the spiritual eyesight to see the wrong that was being done within the heart and center of the work. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. When you have a little bit of sin within the work of God, if it is not faithfully reproved, it begins to permeate through the rest of what's going on. We have a great need of repentance. We have allowed sin into our lives. We need the repentance and the spirit of Christ upon us so that we may more truly see our great need of repentance before we attempt to give any kind of message to the world. Mm -hmm. Testimony 23. I saw that many who profess to be keeping the commandments of God are appropriating to their own use the means which the Lord has entrusted to them and which should come to his treasury. They rob God in tithes and offerings. They dissemble and withhold from God to their own hurt. They bring leanness and poverty upon themselves and darkness upon the church because of their covetousness and in dissembling, in robbing God in tithes and offerings. I saw that many souls will sink in darkness because of their covetousness. The plain straight testimony must live in the church or the curse of God will as surely rest upon his people as it did upon ancient Israel because of their sins. God holds his people as a body responsible for sins existing in individuals among them. If there is a neglect with the leaders of the church to diligently search out the sins which bring the displeasure of God as a body, they become responsible for these sins. But this is the nicest work that men ever engaged in to deal with minds. I have been shown. Yeah, yeah nice. The word nice means uh, like fine or delicate. Right. By the way, just. That doesn't mean pleasant. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but it's the best thing that can be done for those that need to come to grips with the sin in their lives. Mm -hmm. But, but it's a delicate work. It's not something that's, that's going to be uh, simple. It's not going to be pleasant. Yeah. I have been shown that all are not fitted to correct the erring. They have not wisdom to deal justly while loving mercy. They will not be inclined to see the necessity of mingling love and tender compassion with faithful reproof of wrongs. Some will ever be needlessly severe and will not feel the necessity of the injunction of the apostle. And if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. There are many who do not have the discretion of Joshua and who have no special duty to search out wrongs 
and to deal promptly with the sins existing among them. Let not such hinder those who have the burden of this work upon them. Let them not stand in the way of those who have this duty to do. Some make it a point to question and doubt and find fault because others do the work that God has not laid upon them. There's, these stand directly in the way to hinder those upon whom God has laid the burden of reproof and of correcting the sins that are prevailing and that his frown may be turned away from his people. Should a case like Achan's be among us, there are many who would accuse those who might act the part of Joshua in searching out the wrong as having a fault-finding wicked spirit. God is not to be trifled with and his warnings disregarded with impunity by a perverse people. What's being said here? What instruction do we see for ourselves right now? It's not a pleasant picture, is it? No. I was shown that the manner of Aiken's confession was similar to the confessions that some have made and will make among us. They hide their wrongs and refuse to make a voluntary confession until God searches them out. And then they acknowledge their sins. A few persons pass on in a course of wrong until they become hardened. They may even know that the church is burdened, as Achan knew that Israel were made weak before their enemies because of his guilt. Yet their consciences do not condemn them. They will not relieve the church by humbling their proud, rebellious hearts before God and put away their wrongs. God's displeasure is upon his people. And he will not manifest his power in their midst while sins are existing among them and fostered by those in responsible positions. How specific of a warning is this for us today? How much is God trying to tell us now about our own individual condition? Those who work in the fear of God to rid the church of hindrances and to correct grievous wrongs that the people of God may see the necessity of, of abhorring sin and that they may prosper in purity and the name of God be glorified, will ever meet with resisting influences from the unconsecrated. Zephaniah describes the true state of this class and the terrible judgments that will come upon them. Zephaniah is presenting a warning so that we may more clearly understand the warnings that were given by Daniel. Zephaniah is giving the first warning, Daniel is the repeat and enlargement. There are many times that we need to question things that are being said. 
There are many times that we are needing to ask those that are choosing to present what their presentation is about so that we may more clearly understand what they are saying and why. If there are those that believe that the questions are unduly severe or are unwarranted, we have to ask ourselves in the light of this warning from Mrs. White, are we of the accusing attitude? Are we trying to cover up that which should be uncovered? And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their leaves and that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near and hasteneth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty men shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be consumed by fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwelleth in the land. This is the warning that Zephaniah was giving. This is the warning that Zephaniah gave before the warnings of Jeremiah, before the warnings of Daniel. What do we find? How do we find ourselves being described here? What are we to do at this time? What are your thoughts? So when we look at, at these verses here, um, this verse about searching Jerusalem with candles and punishing the men that are settled on their leaves that aren't stirred up, right? Okay saying that the Lord do, would, will not do good, neither will he do evil. I mean, this is a warning about the coming Sunday law. And Jerusalem needs to be searched with candles. Now, exactly what this means, I, I, I don't think we've, we've sort of taken this to heart at all. Um, and we're trying now to, to recognize our present duty. Right. What is it we need to do? So we know that, you know, if we apply this with Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel, in a sense, is searching Jerusalem with candles in the vision of, of chapter 8. He's seen the sins that exist. And so primarily, first, we apply this to ourselves. But this has to happen within the movement. If the movement is going to do the work that God has um, given it to do, which is really the warning of the Sunday law. Not that the movement itself just does it, but it, it starts here. Because um, really other people don't understand the Sunday law. We understand the Sunday law, at least we should, in ways that Adventism in general does not. So... 
Now, it's not an easy message. No, it's not. For further consideration, you will find much of this was presented a second time by Mrs. White in the Review and Herald article published 23rd of September of 1873. And it was entitled The Laodicean Church. Now, the 23rd of September, 1873, in the biblical year's calculation, would have been the first day of the seventh month of that year. Yeah, which is interesting because uh, September 23rd, 2017 was also the first day of the seventh month. And that was the message of July 18th as the prediction before midnight. And the first day of the seventh month, according to the feast at that time, would have been what? Well, it's the Feast of Trumpet, starting with Rosh Hashanah. Is it also not calling us with these Feast of Trumpets to recognize that the Day of Atonement is soon to be upon us? Mm -hmm. And in the Day of Atonement, are we not to let loose to give up our sins, to let those sins go on to judgment before us? If in the heavenly day of atonement, we do not release our sins, what happens to us? Are we not cast out of the camp? Mm -hmm. This, as I look at this now, I'm, this is just a strange question because I didn't look at this before this meeting, but going from the 14th day of the second month of that year to the first day of the seventh month would be how many days from from the which day of which month 14th day of the second month okay so so you're gonna yeah i see what you're saying um well you're gonna have uh take off there's so 137 and So 147 days, three times 49. One, four, seven. That's interesting, isn't it? Is that not the age of Jacob? Yeah, I think it's, so you're saying from the 14th day 16th day of the okay. second month. Okay, you're going to go from the 16th day of the second month. Okay. Uh, see, I, would, I don't know if I counted that wrong. Right. I mean, so the 16th day is to the, the first day of the seventh month. Right. Okay, so it's going to be less than that. So it'd be one, four, five, right? Um. No, it's 126. That one's 126. Because I was counting, I was just counting from the uh, the first day of the second month to the first day okay. of the seventh month. So if you count from the, um, yeah, so it's 126 days. That's even, that, that's even more pregnant with a, uh, a message. Yeah. So between the times of publishment of this article exists 126 days. 
another symbol of the seven times of Leviticus 25 and 26. Mm -hmm. But in that 126 days, Mrs. White is giving a very specific message about what is to occur and a very specific warning with the Laodicean church. One message is to a leader. One message is to the church itself. We have before us a warning from the book of Zephaniah. We have a warning of what is going on currently. Just as we are seeing this message from the book of Judges, we are also seeing a warning from this supposed minor prophet of Zephaniah it is a warning for our time. If God is going to search Jerusalem with candles, if he's going to make a concentrated, detailed search, then what are we to do? Are we not to see to it that in this heavenly day of atonement, that we have cast out all of the leaven within our own lives. Are we not being called to repentance by the warnings of Zephaniah? What are your thoughts at this time? Well, I'm fearing for this movement. <clears throat> if we don't all repent, we're going to be destroyed. The movement is likely to fall apart, except for extremely few that remain. The, the infighting will increase. The curse of God will come upon those who refuse to repent. And frankly, my stomach, like I feel a tension in my gut right now. This has cut me to the heart. And I tried to address it a bit uh, gently, and I got that I should take the matter up with three, cer a certain three people. I thought, I don't want to do this just before Sabbath. I don't want to do it on Sabbath. This coming week, hopefully I'll have my Ellen White app and everything else back here. And I can find the pertinent uh, passages that people need to be referring to. And, you know, and I, I mean, I can use the Bible and all that. I can share some of the ways like the Lord has been dealing with me. But I have that fear. I really have that fear that I am going to be rejected, attacked and everything. And if that happens, then woe to anybody else like i'm nobody i'm absolutely nobody in this movement right and, and i think i desire to be to remain that way but god if he's laid this burden on my heart i have to step forward and do it you know somebody has to do this somebody has to try like there was once other person at the prayer meeting that mentioned there's a lot of disunity and a lot of disparate beliefs among various members of this movement and we need to pray for unity so of course when it came time to pray i prayed for unity and i said let's not be looking at the personalities or the i don't know the the, the thoughts that we might have against one another let's just focus on the message Well, I, I get 132 days now, so I don't know what I did to get 126. But um, 
must have done something wrong. Um, but as far as, you know, to bring about unity, we know that it starts with us individually, but also following the counsel that God has given. So if we feel that someone's in error, we should make, um, take the time to, to minister to that person and to restore them. If we believe that someone is in error, should we not examine their position? Yeah, well, that's one thing we do. Yeah. If we examine their position and their position is right according to scripture, then we need to examine our own hearts. If, however, their position is not right according to scripture, mm -hmm. We have a duty to address this with them. Mm -hmm. If they will not see the issue in the light of scripture, we are then to take others with us, right? Mm -hmm. We're in the situation right now. <clears throat> where there are some that believe that the examinations that are being called for are unduly harsh. Was God harsh in dealing with Achan? Well, that'd definitely be much more harsh than anything that's happening now. But was he harsh in dealing with Achan? Well, he was fair. And, and definitely the, the punishment was, was, was severe. I mean, it's about as far as you can go. Um, I don't know. The word harsh is, is just one of those loaded connotative terms. Did God not give a warning as to what was to happen with the items from Jericho? Yes, so he had given a clear warning and counsel. So his judgment was just. Some people considered it harsh. Right. But it was it was fair. Was God harsh in dealing with the priests of Baal and the priests of the grove? Through Elijah. Oh. I, I can barely hear you. Yeah, William, I can't hear you. Okay. I'm going to say that after. Uh, uh, okay. Um, I'm So the situation with Elijah was one where after three and a half years, the people were called together to make a decision. Will we not also be required to give our decision individually and corporately as to under whose banner we stand. We are going to be searched. We are going to be searched intensely and directly, we have to make our mind up now as to the work that will be done within us. And it is not going to be a pleasant work. It is not going to be easy 
but it is going to be necessary. Consider carefully this portion of Zephaniah. We have more to cover within this book where we need to understand before we are able to give any kind of message today. We are drawing close, close to the close of our time together. Do we have any other thoughts or comments at this time? Yes, <clears throat> I have my book, my Patriarchs and Prophets book open here, and I'll just show a few quotes from 496 and 497. Okay. The influence needs to be feared by the church is not that of open opposers, infidels, and blasphemers, but of inconsistent professors of Christ. These are the ones that keep back the blessing of the God of Israel and bring weakness upon his people. When the church is in difficulty, when coldness and spiritual declension exist, giving occasion for the enemies of God to triumph, then instead of folding their hands and lamenting their unhappy state, let its members inquire if there is not an Achan in the camp. Well, that's personal sin. With humiliation and searching of heart, let each seek to discover the hidden sins that shut out God's presence. And further down, it says, there is a vast difference between admitting facts after they have been proved and confessing sins known only to ourselves and to God. So confessions will be made by the guilty when they stand before the bar of God, etc., etc. Then it says, so long as they can conceal their transgressions from their fellow men, Many like Achan feel secure and flatter themselves that God will not be strict to mark iniquity. All too late their sins will find them out in that day when they shall not be purged with sacrifice or offering forever. And then it talks about the records of heaven being open. My goodness, we need to be aware that the records of heaven, I mean, our, everything we do is being recorded at this moment. We are actually being judged moment by moment. This is the sealing time. We need to get really, really serious. And I'm thinking, so there's so many times I've been wishy-washy and, and inconsistent. And, and this speaks to me as much as to everybody else, you know, and, and I'm asking the Lord for forgiveness and to make me as strong as, as steel, so to speak, or to be fervent in his service and to be true. And, uh, and I don't know all the goings on behind the scenes. I don't know any of you all that well. I don't know much of your background or anything like that, but I have a respect for all of you. And I sure have a contempt for the, the garbage in my own life and, and the way I, because I'm thinking if, if there's a weakness in a building, I'm thinking we're all individual stones. And if one of us is crumbling, if one of us is, is decaying, then the whole building will, will, will be affected. And how much, of a, of how much guilt do I carry for not strengthening the movement? You know, it's very, very serious. Okay. Any other comment? Any other thought? Shall we then close the meeting with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, As we look upon Christ and we see our characters in a mirror, we see ourselves clothed in rags. There is nothing that we have of ourselves to commend ourselves to you. As we come before you, we ask for your forgiveness of our sins. We ask, Father, for your guidance. We ask for your strength. We ask for your mercy. 
Help us that we may be clothed in your robes, not in the robes of our own making. Help us, Father, that your guidance and your direction may become clear so that we may give up our sins, including those cherished sins. Help us to become the witness that you would want us to be at this time in our history. Help us now be with us through this Sabbath. May your will be done. May we enter into this rest and be truly blessed by you, by your spirit, and through your son. For this we thank you, and for this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.